Hello everyone. Welcome to this week's session. This is session 12 and this is called God Expects. The one true God is just and he expects his people to demonstrate their faith through right living. I grew up as a preacher's kid. My parents clearly loved the Lord and they clearly love their kids as well. However, there was a set of expectations on us kids of how we were to act and behave. Now, my obedience to these guidelines and expectations didn't make me any more or less their son. I was their son by birth. However, how I handled and followed these expectations affected our relationship. As a Christian, we are expected to demonstrate our faith by living up to God's expectations. How well or how poorly we do that does not affect our status as God's son or daughter. However, it does affect our relationship to him. We are part of the family of God and we have family expectations. And we're challenged as Christians to match our faith, what we say, with what we do with action. In our text, we're going to see that the people of Judah were being hypocrites toward God. They proclaimed faith, and they proclaimed wanting to be near God, and they performed many rituals or religious activities. However, their true heart was not close to God. It was not really seeking God. It was self-serving. This session will cover three chapters in the book of Isaiah, 58, 59, and 60. And our highlighted text for tonight is chapter 58, the first 12 verses. God comes right out of the gate in verse 1, saying to Isaiah, cry out, don't hold back from these people. You need to get this message to them. It is urgent and it's serious. God is instructing Isaiah not to hold back the severity of this message he's going to give them. I'm not sure if there's many things that God hates more than a hypocrite. In verse 2, God is accusing the people of Israel and Judah of acting like a nation that wants to seek righteousness and seek justice, that delights in the Lord. They're, they're just acting like one. You might remember we kind of covered this topic earlier in our study when the people of Judah were holding these uh, rituals and religious ceremonies and they were doing all these extra sacrifices to God and God told them that your lips say that you know, you want to be near me. Your lips give me worship and praise. However, your hearts are far from me. There's a hypocrisy there. There's a, a false piety there. God is addressing this again. However, instead of additional sacrifices and festivals, the topic goes to fasting. Now, what do you think of when you think of fasting? You think of probably first and foremost food, uh, not partaking in food for a certain amount of time. And maybe even in addition to that, uh, you might consider uh, doing something that is spiritual in lieu of eating. So like those times that you would perhaps eat lunch or eat your snack or dinner, you would spend time in prayer in those times instead of eating, or you would spend time in the word of God. Now the people of Judah were doing this. They were fasting. They were abstaining from things. They were denying themselves food. However, they weren't replacing it with anything. They were only doing it for attention. We see that they become indignant. They're crying out to God saying, God, we fasted. You're not even listening to us. Like, this is going unnoticed. Like, we're fasting and, and we're not getting anything out of it. But God sees right through it. He knows their heart. He sees the true intention of the people. He says, you do as you please on the day that you fast. You, you become irritable and you are vicious on days that you fast, maybe because they're just getting too hungry. He said that you spread out in ashes and sackcloth, basically saying you make a big deal of it. You make sure everyone sees what you're doing. Make sure that people know what you're doing. You really aren't fasting because you want to do something spiritual. You want to be closer to the Lord. You're doing it so you can be seen. Or even worse, you're doing it because you want God to answer your prayer like he's some genie who's just going to respond if you do this certain action. In verses 6 and 7, God presents a fasting that is acceptable to him. Let's look at it because it's very different than what the people of Judah were thinking. And it's maybe even very different than what we think. The Lord says, isn't this the fast I choose? 
to break the chains of wickedness, to untie the ropes of the yoke, to set the oppressed free, and to tear off every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, to bring the poor and homeless into your house, to clothe the naked when you see him, and not to ignore your own flesh and blood? Gee, Isaiah, that's not really fasting at all, is it? God's saying that's, that's true fasting. You see, fasting is about you becoming more Christ-like and displaying a more godly character. We don't just skip a meal or two during the day just to say we did it and then hope God will reward us for that. The focus needs to be on us producing a godly character. Then we're going to focus on others. Did you see that stark difference of what the people of Judah were doing in their fasting? They were focusing on themselves and God's acceptable fasting. They're focusing on others. They're focusing on a key characteristic of God, and that is his justice. God says, you're going to break the chains of the wickedness. You're going to set the oppressed free. You're going to share your bread with the hungry. Bring in the poor and the homeless. Clothe the naked. Don't ignore your family. To get closer to God means that you're getting close to that godly, Christ-like character, which means you're going to focus more on others. And your focus on others is based on the justice of God. God is a God of justice, and we should be a people of justice. So when we see people oppressed, we should care about it. God says, then your light will appear like the dawn. He's saying, then you'll get it. Then you'll understand. Then you'll be a light to the world. What's interesting to note here is at the end of the chapter, in verses 13 and 14, the people are indicted because they're not keeping the Sabbath. They put all this focus on fasting, but they're not even keeping the Sabbath, which was one of the Ten Commandments. That's like one of the big ten. Believe it or not, fasting is nowhere commanded to be done in the Bible. Now, every time it's talked about, it is talked about favorably. And Jesus said, when you fast, and then gave us instructions for fasting. So it's not wrong to fast. In fact, it seems to be a very normal thing for the Christian life. However, there's no explicit command in Scripture to fast. So the people were focusing on a tradition, on a man-made ritual and tradition, and trying to please the Lord that way, but they weren't even following one of the Ten Commandments, one of the very basic instructions. I think that is so relatable because we sometimes miss the forest for the trees. We try to please the Lord and we, we go about it our own way. And we, we, we try to come up with these ways that we in our heads say, this is going to please God. I'm going to do this. But we, we miss the biggies. We miss do not lie. Do not steal. Do not commit adultery. The Ten Commandments. We don't even get the big ones. I relate to this. In college, I stepped away from the church for a while. I went through that cliche phase of life where you go to college and you become too smart for God and you think you know better. And I never considered myself not a Christian. I never considered myself to walk away from the faith, but I wasn't going to church regularly. I wasn't fellowshipping with a body of believers. I wasn't committed to the apostles' teaching and to the prayers. I would do other things. I would study philosophy and say, well, this is my way of honoring God. I'm using my mind. I'm using my brain. I'm considering and thinking and meditating on what God is and what God could be. I totally missed the mark. We do things that we think this will please God, but it's really something in our own head that we've concocted. We don't even get the biggies right. And then we're mad when God isn't happy with what we come up with, when we've been given everything we need for spiritual life and to produce God-like, Christ-like character. Now, fasting here is just one example. It could be any religious ritual that you perform that you think you are doing to impress God, to impress God with your spirituality. How do we fight that line of thinking? Well, we have to know scripture. We have to know what God requires of us. We have to know how God wants us to live. And in this chapter in 58 here, we get wonderful advice. Our lives should be centered around others. It all comes back to the greatest commandment, love 
your neighbor as yourself. God says, once you guys get that right, then I'm going to answer your prayers. I'm going to listen to you again. Into chapter 59, we get more of Israel and Judah's condition, the state that they are in. And it's a sad state of affairs. God explains that he is able, he is ready, and he is willing to save his people, to bring them back. However, it's their sin and rebellion that is separating them. We see a bleak picture of the state of affairs in the beginning of chapter 59. And, and Isaiah recognizes this, and he actually laments the state of affairs that God's chosen people are in. They have not known the path of peace, and there is no justice in their ways. They have made their roads crooked. No one who walks on them will know peace. Therefore, justice is far from us. And righteousness does not reach us. We hope for light, but there is darkness for brightness, but we live in the night. Isaiah is lamenting and confessing to the Lord, saying, I see what you're saying, God. We as a people are, are displaying no justice, and your justice is far from us because of it. In chapter 60, God promises again that his people would be a blessing and a light to the nations. Their fortune would turn. The tables would flip. And not only would they come back into God's favor, but they would be a vessel with which God's grace would be extended. And we know that that was always part of the promise made to Abraham all the way back in Genesis 12, that the people of every nation, of every tongue and tribe in the earth would be blessed through this nation of Israel. They are blessed because the Messiah comes through their line and is a savior not just for the Israelites, but for the entire world, for anyone who has faith alone in Jesus Christ. God has a certain set of expectations for his family. And how well you obey those expectations is going to affect your relationship with him. Spiritual acts of worship that are heartless are not going to please God. God will never be pleased with worship apart from your obedience. And our obedience is going to have a focus on other people. And ultimately, that obedience is going to lead to a satisfied life in God. Our memory verse for this week is in chapter 58, and it is verse 11. The Lord will always lead you, satisfy you in a parched land, and strengthen your bones. You will be like a watered garden and like a spring whose water never runs dry. Thank you for joining us this week. I can't believe we're basically all the way through this study. Next session, next week, is going to be our very last session, uh, so be sure to catch that. Uh, reach out to me. Let me know how this study's been going for you. I'd love to hear from you. Drop me a note when you get a chance. Have a great week, and God bless.